Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. Before we get into it with our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Angela Nork on the podcast coming to us all the way from South Carolina, where, I mean, she can tell you all she wants about it being hu- humid and she wants to get rid of all that, where it's like, you're from the North, okay? Just enjoy it while, while that you have it at least, but She's on here to, you know, share her health and fitness journey and, you know, talk about her bodybuilding journey and just really discuss all things health and fitness. But most importantly, she is our current guest. Angela, thank you so much for coming on. Of course. Well, I asked this as the first question to every guest that I have on, regardless of what they do. What is the weather like in your neck of the woods right now? Hot and humid. A little bit rainy. Well, we just got done with a massive rainstorm, so I'm glad that that is over now. But, um... Yeah, up here we're like in the 60s, which I mean, if it wasn't raining, it would be absolutely perfect. I mean, so I really can't have any complaints, but you know, then again, I got about a month left before I can start, you know, really thinking about, I mean, last year we had six inches of snow on October 17th, I think it was, which is like, which was like a new record for like how long. So I, again, I I don't have any optimism about what's going to happen in the winter because I've lived through it too many damn times. But before we depress everyone with that, because that's a whole sob story that, you know, is going to take away about half the people listening to this podcast because they're like, oh my God, I don't want to hear about how he froze to death. But why don't you give us your backstory, Angela, first off on what really inspired and motivated you to get in shape and how that led to you becoming a bodybuilder? Um. Okay, well, uh, let's see. I always... I really wasn't very much of an athlete, like, growing up. I mean, I played, like, occasional, like, volleyball in middle school, occasional softball, but never really, like, super consistent with with athletics. And then um, I had kids, very young, but I was still on the smaller side. Um, I actually had two kids as a teenager. I had my first son when I was 15 and my second son when I was 19. Um, And then... um, due to more just like ignorance, like I'm one of six, my parents were Italian and Irish and my dad, they were hard workers. And they just in in that time, there wasn't a lot of education about nutrition and food. And like, basically just to feed a family of six on kind of a middle income, you know, we ate a lot of pasta and rice and uh, my dad being a hardcore Italian, like showed love with food. And, uh, we just didn't really, I, it it was more just ignorance. And I don't even mean that in a bad way. I just wasn't educated really on how to eat and how to be fit. So in my early twenties, I actually, um, got morbidly obese, um, up until I think when I was about 27, um, I, my top weight was, um, I, I, the last time I was weighed and really knew what I was, was about 260 pounds. Um, yeah. And, uh, I, my health was like spiraling out of control and, um, I actually was going to have a gastric bypass and I went to a doc, I went and had like a meeting about it. I had all this classic like health issues, like pre-diabetes. I had polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, and just like, I was feeling very ill at that weight. Um, and so I, I went to my doctor to have uh, I needed her to sign off on me having a gastric bypass. And, um, I sat in her, she took me into her regular office and she said, look, I'm not, she asked me what I ate in a day, what I was doing to exercise. And I made all the typical kind of excuses. Like I didn't think I had a bad diet. Like to me at the time, like not getting, not having mayonnaise on my BLT or like not cheese on my Chipotle. Oh, I don't even know if there was Chipotle at that time, but whatever. Like, you know what I mean? Like, to me, that was like, I was like, I get a salad from Wendy's and a baked potato. Um, and, and, and also, um, like, I just didn't really even know how to exercise. And I used the fact that I had to work and I had two kids. Like, I was just like, there's just not time for it. Just like the typical. And she was like, look, like, you're too young to have this surgery. You haven't really put in the effort that you could put in um, to losing weight. The surgery comes with a lot of complications. It's very expensive. And she said, you need to get honest with yourself and quit making excuses. And um, she gave me a card for a personal trainer. And she said, you need to do this on your own. Try harder on your own. And I'm not going to refer you for a gastric bypass. And I literally walked out of her office, sat in my car. And that was the first time I got honest with myself. And I was like, you know what? She's right. She's absolutely right. I haven't done what I need to do. I could be doing better. And then that first year mainly through small diet changes. Um, I lost a hundred pounds. 
Um, and then I just, as I started to lose weight, then I felt like I could work out a little bit more. Um, I it was helpful that I had friends who showed me uh, what to do in the gym. And um, I kind of did like um, some fitness competition, not bodybuilding, but like, um, like turbulence training and like magazine shoots where I got, I, I got skinny, but I really wasn't, I wasn't into resistance training and weight training at that point. But I got very, I got small. I got down to, in the end, I ended up getting to like, um, I think I was like 140 pounds, which is a very healthy weight at 5'4". Um, and so then um, I went to see that same doctor and she was like, it was a year later and she was like, I can't tell, she came into the office laughing. She's like, I can't tell you how many times I've had that conversation with people and it doesn't matter go anywhere. And at that point, she told me, you know, you, you really need to think about going on birth control because now that you've lost all this weight, um, I know you have, I, she's like, you could get pregnant. And I was like, I'm not going to go on birth control and worry about gaining weight after all this. So long story short, um, six weeks later, I um, was back in her office for a, my six-week pregnancy exam because I was pregnant. Um, yeah. So I was like, not expecting it at that point. My boys at that point were 12 and 15. Um, and she was like, okay. So I, I ended up having my daughter. I gained about like 60 pounds during that pregnancy. But at that time, during right at the time I found out I was pregnant, my ex-husband was also opening a CrossFit gym. So, and I, now I had education and there was a lot more knowledge and availability to information at that time. So I was able to work out all during my pregnancy. I had much better nutrition. Um, and then after I had my daughter, um, I lost a significant amount of weight, but was still right around like 170 pounds. And I just, I did CrossFit for a couple of years. I never really felt like I looked like as much as I worked out, like kind of a typical like CrossFit. Like I'm very grateful for CrossFit because it introduced me to a barbell and to serious weight training and it challenged me in a way. Um, but after a few years, I was like, why the hell don't I look like I kind of hovered right around like 170 pounds. It was just like fluffy, strong, but fluffy. So I was like, why do I not look like I uh, work out as much as I do? And then I went to the Arnold um, more as a CrossFit kind of fan. To, to meet all the CrossFit athletes, the Arnold competi sports competition. Um, and I ended up watching their bodybuilding show. And that was the first time that I was like, huh, maybe this is something I could, like, like a little seed was planted. Uh, and then I, I ended up working with RP Strength, which is an awesome company. And one of the people that I saw at the Arnold that year was a uh, He's now an IFBB pro, Jared Feather. He's a coach for um, Renaissance Periodization, RP Strength. He's their, um, he was their main bodybuilding coach. And I contacted him and I just was like, I just kind of threw it out there. I was like, at this point, I think I was 34, 35, maybe 36. And I was like, I just kind of felt like I was too old. I was completely ignorant to bodybuilding at all, I, I, other than what I had seen. And I contacted Jared and I was like, um, is this something that's even possible for me? Like, could I ever even compete? And Jared basically was like, well, yeah, you can. Like, it is absolutely can. And that was the beginning of my bodybuilding journey at um, like about 35, 36 years old. I, that first year I competed for the first time. Um, that naturally, I was in natural competitions. Um, and then I worked with Jared for two years, two or three years. Um, and then last year, um, I s decided to switch, switch over to the MPC, and that's when I started working with Justin Mahaley, um, who's my coach now. Um, and they both were awesome, and I've learned a bunch, and that puts me going now. So that is wow! What an incredible story. And I gotta say, I'm six three, two hundred five myself. So the fact that you were basically a foot shorter than me, plus about sixty pounds, really shows how great of a transformation you made. And I gotta say too, I'm one eighth Italian myself on my mom's my mom's mom. But um, how – it's a medical mystery for me how Italians aren't all like 450 pounds because of all the great food that they have. I don't know what that's all about too because, yeah, every Sunday at our house when I was growing up was literally just spaghetti, just meatloaf, everything. Just It's just – 
I mean, it's great. I love it. And just bread. I mean, I've had so much bread. I've had enough bread for about 10 lifetimes already and I'm only 27. So, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's something, but that is just, yeah, that is just such a great story for you. And I mean, when you were getting started, you know, really taking things seriously in the gym, I, I told you just before, I mean, it's a myth that I love to bust every time I do this podcast, you know, did you have that fear that a lot of women have that, you know, you might get like, Oh, I'm going to get way too big just from looking at it. And I mean, like, you, like, well, obviously like you didn't, but even, I mean, I bet you still hear that all the time now. How do you like to respond to that? Cause that is something that still pops up. Uh, yeah. So I think because my journey into weight training really was laid in kind of a CrossFit foundation. And at that time, so many of the women in CrossFit, like Camille, um, Camille and Catherine David's daughter and all of those, like they were so celebrated for their bodies, especially initially. And many of them had very healthy bodies. Like I got to see Camille win the CrossFit games, uh, Camille LeBlanc, Bezanay. And she had like a little bit of belly fat, even, I mean, they had very, still very natural bodies. Um, and, and really the focus was more on the strength than your physique. So I think because my journey into fitness started more as a getting stronger and kind of beating myself and getting physical and just getting physically healthier and physically better each workout. Um, and that's where it began that I didn't, I never had a focus on, oh my God, I'm going to look like a man or anything like that. Like it just wasn't. And then now, um, I would say just now really more in the last year as my body, like, you know, continually progressed and I'm more muscular now. Um, I take it as a compliment. If someone says I look like a man, I'm like, yeah, like I finally made it. Because with the preconceived notion, even though this is not true, I mean, truthfully, I do have better shoulders than probably 75% of the dudes I work out with. Um, but like the preconceived notion of what's masculine, like I want to, the more jacked, the better. So I don't, I take it as a compliment. If someone says I look like a man and if it, and those opinions just, I think once you are really passionate about the sport of bodybuilding and you're very secure in yourself. Like, look, I'm 40 years old. I, I've never really, I compare myself for the actual sport of bodybuilding, like where I need to be to compete. But on the daily, I don't, I just want to be better for myself. So I don't, I don't honestly give a fuck about anyone. Sorry about the language, but I don't, I don't give a crap about anyone's opinion about me other than my own opinion and how I feel about myself physically. And of course I care about my coach's opinion and where he thinks my physique needs to be. Other than that, like, I don't care. And if I do get trolled every now and then on like Instagram, I'm like, I actually have, I'm like, you guys, I'm getting trolled. It's amazing. I'm a celebrity. 40 years old and she doesn't look a day over 25. Everyone, if that isn't about the benefits of weight training, I don't know what is, but one thing that impacts, especially women, I think so much more than men and it's more positively too, but it impacts men as well. Is that confidence boost that working out gives you and that's one, and that's the one thing that you can take from the gym and use to impact every single aspect of your life. How have you personally taken that confidence boost that working out has given you and use it to make your life better? I mean, in every single aspect of my life, like people are like, why do you love bodybuilding? Cause I love, I love improvement in all ways, like professionally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And the confidence that I gain from bodybuilding and beating myself in the gym and continually improve in the gym, that confidence carries through in the leader. I am in my, I own my own business. I'm a, a confident leader because of that. Um, I feel like that I'm confident in the decisions that I make as a parent because of it. Um, it, it, it literally affects every single aspect of my life. I, I, I'm confident in the decisions that I, that I make, like I'm confident in not winning. I'm care I'm confident in even making wrong decisions because I know that's where a lot of my learning is going to come from. So, um, yeah. What well, what was your friends and family's reaction? Like when you announced to them that you wanted to become a bodybuilder? Oh, everyone has always been super supportive of me. Um, I think my family, because I am from originally from a small town in Ohio. Um, I moved away to South Carolina 20 years ago, um, where I, and, and I was, on my own. And I also, I worked for a hair care manufacturer where I got to travel and teach hair classes. So I've gotten to see, I've been all around the country. I've been to every state almost in the United States. And a lot of that traveling was alone. So it kind of caused me to 
kind of way step outside of my comfort zone and to meet a lot of different people and different cultures and it kind of changed me as a person as opposed to staying in small town Ohio for your entire life. Um, so I wouldn't say that my family necessarily gets it as much as like my friends and my bodybuilding community get it, but that's okay. You don't have to get it. They're supportive. Yeah, abs- absolutely. My, let's say my mom's 77 years old. She's like, Angela, I don't know what you're trying to prove. You're so beautiful. Why are you trying to change? And I'm like, I'm a, Okay. I mean, let's be honest. Back back when your mom was was your age when you started, like the only physical activity you really got was really just like working around the yard and doing all that other stuff, like that like that old school workout where like the guys would just go out and just do like farm work, and then that's the only workout that they do. So that I can understand like from that generation, just because things were just different. But I mean, yeah, that and that's yeah, great, and that's great. Proud and very proud. Yeah. she's supportive. Oh, and that's all that, that's all that you can really ask for because I've heard so many stories of people who their family might not be as supportive and it makes your journey so much harder, but yeah, just having that support really does mean the world. But I love to talk genetics on this podcast because everyone's on Instagram and social media and I hear this all the time. Oh my God, I want his arms. I want her abs. I want their back. And it's like, I almost want to choke him and be like, you do not understand that if you work out just like them, you're not going to see those results because everyone's built differently. But on top of that, whenever someone first gets started working out, they always have that one body part that really takes off that they don't have to train as much. And they have that one body part that just drags behind that they have to train to oblivion. I mean, for me, my back was the one thing that really developed really nicely. I mean, I rarely ever have to train it, but I'm 6'3", so my legs and my lower body are just absolutely shot. Where I could train, I always make the joke about calves. I could inject pure muscle into my calves, and they wouldn't, and they wouldn't gain an ounce. I mean, it's just unfortunate for me, but fortunately, typical for a man. Like, yep. yeah, I don't even train calves, and I have pretty nice calves. So, so what? So, but, but what were those body parts for you? What was one that really took off, and then one that you really had to just train to oblivion? Um. So I'm just naturally very quad dominant. I, a lot of people think I'm a wellness athlete just because my quads are like fairly large. Um, so quads, I can like have always been very confident in the size of my legs. Um, and, and my back surprisingly, like I love training back and I, my back just responds very well to training. Um, the hardest part for me is to, I have to diet very low to lean out in the midsection um, I have a lot of loose skin. Of, I don't, luckily for me, for being as big, I, because I so slowly and trained the entire time, my loose skin is minimal and it really only gets bad when I'm very, very lean. Um, so my glutes and I have a low back injury. So my glutes also get, and get affected by that as well. So my glutes hold a lot of fat, so it's great in the off season because I get like kind of a big butt. But then as soon as I get lean, I start to like lose my butt very quick. So I have to work on those glutes. That's where we're we're really going to hit those hard in this off season and try to. That was definitely some feedback from this last competition season is to grow the glutes, and then my arms. I held fat in my arms, um, but my arms, especially in the last year, have really responded nicely, and I want to continue to grow my delt. So. Um, delts need more work. They need to be bigger and, um, the quads and back. We're kind of keeping, keeping going too. Well, and I mean, I love to ask this question. I've had, you know, for the vast majority of my guests on here, they either were like in sports, you know, early on in life and stuff, but you're one of probably like a few dozen that I've had on that, you know, had a dramatic weight loss. I always like to ask the people that go through that. What is that like for you mentally? Because I mean, I hear it all the time that people who, you know, might be, overweight when especially when they're younger you know you sort of identify as that person then like you're the overweight person like that's that's kind of like your your role unfortunately because especially with like kids and stuff but going from one extreme to the other what has that change been like for you mentally just seeing your body change from someone who you were before to where you look right now because I think that just must have been just a very big sort of shock for you just to see yourself even if it was slowly to see yourself just slowly go from one extreme to the other really um I I don't even really truly remember how I was mentally at that time because this was now like 15, 16 years ago. Um, However, what I will say is that I honestly feel like it was a very necessary part of my journey because um, if I hadn't experienced that, I like, I can empathize so much with someone who's saying like they're obese and they're like, I don't know, I can't do this. Um, because I know, I know that I didn't, I, you know, like I wasn't a person who went to McDonald's and got six cheeseburgers 
and like raged on large pizzas every night and all that. It wasn't, I was just kind of a normal person that just didn't know better on a lot of things. Like I maybe got fast food a couple times a week. And then I would kind of do like a lot of women do where they starve themselves all day, don't eat breakfast. And then they kind of consume giant bowls of pasta at night. Um, so I relate very much and, and I'm, so I'm almost grateful for the fact I, I wouldn't change the fact that I was obese at one point because it so much affects who I am as a person now and being empathetic with other people and also saying like, it's not too late for you. Like you can have your best freaking body at 40 years old, at 45, at 50. Like I guarantee you my body is way freaking better at 40 than it was at 26 and my physical health and mental health, my spiritual health, all of it. Um, so yeah, the only thing that's tough for me that I said about being obese and now being a bodybuilder, like I said, I do struggle with loose skin. So a little bit, so much, it could be so much worse. But when you're competing on a national level on stage, like the tightness of your skin does matter. Uh, so that's just one thing now that I'm kind of dealing with. It's like, God, I wish I hadn't beat my body up so much in my 20s. You know, like I really wish. Um, and I, I also see very young bodybuilders that are professionals. A lot of these pro, especially figure girls, they're 22, 23. They look phenomenal. A lot of them started off very skinny. That's where they started their journey. And they have kind of a elitist and righteous mindset. Because they were naturally athletic, they're genetic freaks, and they had they started enhancement and special subs very early on, and they never know what it's like to be obese. And so they're in a very strong place of a judgment or overweight. And I'm like, I don't feel like they should be able to have an opinion unless you've been there. Because it's it's completely different to comp to become a professional and to put on a lot of muscle as an 18 year old at that has amazing genetics. 90% of those people that are the pros that compete in their early 20s, 90% of them aren't going to last, you know, 10 years in the sport. And once you get off the sup, once you get off the supplements, most of them probably might be obese then later on in life after they finally, you know, done everything. You know, once they like right now, bodybuilding is their priority, but um, maybe once they get married, have children, like talk to me when you're 40. Okay. But no, the point is, it's just like, it's definitely, it's actually more of a positive impact to me having been obese because like I said, it just, it has me be so much more empathetic to other people. Yeah. And that's, Hey, that is one of the best qualities to have in this. That's what, that's one thing that I've found out in my short time on this planet. But, um, just with this sport, you know, in general, there are a lot of misconceptions that people have about it. What's one of the, probably the most common things you hear about when you might talk to people about bodybuilding who aren't that familiar with the sport? I mean, obviously, one of the huge things is just like, you know, people really believe that like steroid use or special supplements or whatever, that that is, you know, that that that's like people are just basically handing out pills at the show, basically, and stuff like that. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like if they're if you're willing to do steroids, like you could be a bodybuilder. And it's so uh, far from the truth. Like you, you could take all the supplements in the world. If you're not going to diet, if you're not going to train a certain type of way, it, your body's going to look exactly the same. It's not worse. Like steroids don't change your body. Steroids, supplements and enhancement can help, can be a part of the journey. They don't have to be. I competed naturally for three years before I was enhanced. And, uh, it, you can have, we can look back on my pictures, you know, like you can have muscle and you can be without any of that you if you're not willing to do the work it's it, you're not going to go anywhere that's definitely and then one of the other things is like another big misconception is people think that bodybuilding is like super healthy and I, like i people especially this last competition being like oh my god i envy you so much when i was like very conditioned and very lean and i'm like please don't like i'm suffering yeah right come now. visit me at night basically yeah yeah no come visit me anytime alone like I'm basically like on the lowest amount of calories I could possibly be on. I have two hours of cardio. Hey, if they're going for the skeleton look though, that's maybe what they're looking for though. Yeah. I mean, maybe, but yeah, I'm like, this is for a specific sport. This is, this is not 
a longevity. This is not how I meant to maintain. Like I actually prefer my physique um, thicker. I like my physique in the off season. Um, so that's, that's probably the biggest, those two biggest things. Like, like people are relying on drugs and then also that bodybuilders stay lean 24, seven, 365 days a year and that insane conditioning. And that's just not possible or healthy. Absolutely. And I mean, your time management must be insane because being a mom, that's a full-time job, but in and of itself, and you have a regular job and you're also a bodybuilder. So you basically have three professions that you're doing at once. How are you able to get through the day doing that? Because I mean, I have, you know, a job and then I also work out too. And for me, that seems almost impossible, but you have that extra added thing. How, how do you do it? I'm the queen of preparation. Um, I'm psychotic about time management. I think most bodybuilders, especially if they have a full-time gig, especially if they have kids, you have to become almost obsessive about your routines um, because that's what allows me to continue to do what I do. Like, um, so like every single day I, like I prepare my coffee with the mug underneath in the hint I have and the pot in it. I have all my supplements laid out in the order that I take them. I go as far as putting my skillet for my egg whites on the stove. Um, I put, uh, my, my bowl and my plate are laid out for my breakfast in the morning. I prepare 18 meals. I grocery shop every Saturday morning at seven in the morning. I am at Walmart. The first person when it opens, I buy the exact same groceries. I used to work I, at Sam's club. So I know those type of people. So you're one of those people. Yeah. <laughs> I still prep at 6am every Sunday on Saturday night. I lay out all 18 containers and everything that I'm going to need for my meal prep for the next morning. Um, every day I lay out my clothes for the next day. I have my gym bag packed. Um, I have all my lunch bag is on the counter, ready to go with the ice packs. Um, I have a plan for every single day. I know exactly what the priority is for the day. I make sure that I have time to do my hair, my makeup. I run my salon. I'm the owner of a most amazing salon here. I make sure that I'm coming in here to give positive energy. So I wake up at four in the morning and I have my coffee I eat breakfast around like 4.35. Then I'm at the gym by like 5.30 to 6.30. Right now I just have 15 minutes of cardio. I go to star the same Starbucks at 7 a.m. Between 7 and 7.20 every day. I have my coffee on the beach uh, for about 15, 20 minutes. That's where I do like a little bit of reflection, gratitude, worship, a um, little worship time. And then I'm back to my house usually by 8. Uh, and that's where I shower, get ready. And I'm at my salon by 9, 30, 10. And then I pick up my daughter in the afternoon. And we start the day all over. And I'm in bed by usually 8, 8, 30. Okay, can you just like abandon your family for a week and come up to Minnesota and teach me your ways? Because like literally, I am the exact opposite where everything is just like on the go other than like jobs and stuff that I've like set down where literally, yeah, I am love just. It. I love this life. Like I love it. It caught it for me, that stability of knowing what my routine is going to be is it's so much a part of me. And I love, I look forward to everything. I look forward to getting up in the morning and going to the gym. I look forward to having my oatmeal. I look forward to, um, going to get my coffee and seeing my Starbucks baristas that are so positive in the morning. I look forward to going down to the beach and worshiping and seeing the sunrise I look forward to coming into my salon and bringing positive energy to my team and all my clients. I get to see that day. Like if there's a part of the, what the hardest part of this is that there's things that come up in life where your routine is altered. And that's when I really have to check my energy because I get so attached to that routine because it makes me feel so positive that when it is thrown off, I'm like, Oh my God, Nope, we can't have this. I got to stick to it. So I, you, We'll find that most bodybuilders, especially very serious or top level bodybuilders, most of us are very routine driven individuals. We do the exact same things at the same times at the same. And it's just, it's part of who we are. It's embedded in our mindset. Yeah. I've only met one like serious bodybuilder. That's kind of like me, where just everything's like in the air where you don't know. And that person was probably the most impressive human being just because I was like, how are you able to do that? But I don't, they got to write a book or publish something or whatever, just doing that. But that is just so awesome. And we talked about this before, but one of the things that is just so hard for a lot of these compares that no one in the general public would ever really know about is posing. I mean, I compare it now to being a perfect driver where you can be a great driver. You can never be a perfect driver. You can be a great poser. You can never be a perfect poser. It's always ever evolving. What is your experience with posing been like? Oh my God thankfully I right off the bat, my coach, my very first coach, Jared was like, you need to work with a posing coach. 
So I work with posing coaches right from the beginning. Um, I've had the honor to work with several figure pros um, to pose with me. And then in this last season, um, in a, uh, my very good friend, Ashley Jones, who's competing at the Olympia this year, she's a physique athlete. She won the Texas pro this year, who is the most, she also won the posing best poser there award. She won Sarah's best poser award. She's, in, she's just incredible. Um, I got the opportunity to work with her every single week and she gave me feedback. Like that is the missing link. And most, that's another thing. Most bodybuilders that are wanting to be a pro level or are at a pro level will tell you, like, if you can have the best package in the world, if you don't know how to present that on stage, you literally are doing yourself a disservice. And it's so obvious when you are on stage, who has not worked with a closing coach? Like it is part of the formula. And if you skip that part of the formula, you will suck and you will not win. I was just looking up Ashley Jones on my phone because is that, is this her? That's my boo. Holy crap. She's got to be on the podcast. Good God. She's going to win the Olympia. I'm calling it here. Calling it. Dude, you want her on your podcast. She, and the other thing about Ashley Jones too, this was so amazing. Was like, we, and we connected on a personal level. She is on Justin Mahaley's team. He's her coach as well. Um, so we're on the same team, but her energy would literally put me in a better mood. Like, I don't know if you've ever been around somebody that's just like an angel where it's like, after I would have my posing sessions, I would be so low. I'd be so tired. But just of having been around her, she's just so positive and such a an amazing spirit that it would put me in a better mood. And it and she helped me believe in me. And that 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 had me go out on stage like Sasha freaking fierce. Like I, I she she made me believe in me. And as as far as my posing especially, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to work with her. And I'll continue to work with her. And actually. Even, even now in the gym, I, I was at this morning, even now in the gym, I had leg day today. I go through my posing routine in between sets. Like it just has to be ingrained in you like second nature. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I don't give my opinions on anything in this podcast cause it's none of my biz, but yeah, she does have a really good shot at the Olympia this year. I think she looks, she looks amazing. Although the competition, it goes, it goes through Andrea Shaw's arms really. I mean, that's just something that's, you know, that's, that's going to be a good competition though. That's going to be, that's going to be awesome. And yeah, I'd love to have her on. So I'll definitely send her a message after I'm done talking to you, but yeah, it's you just. Told, tell her that Angela, you talked to Angela today. Yeah, absolutely. And then, I mean, just what is that moment like for you when you get to step up on that stage, you know, after working your butt off for so long and going through a prep, which is not, it's not a bunch of roses. Let's be completely honest to just finally be able to walk up on stage and show off that package that you've been working on for so long. What is that moment like for you? Absolute sheer joy. I can't even, if you haven't experienced it, there's really no way to describe it because it's like absolute bliss. It's a combination of pride, um, relief, joy, confidence, um, like everything you, it's because all the work leads up into that moment. So when, and there's no, for me, there's, I'm really not nervous. Like the national stage, I was a little bit nervous just cause I didn't know what to expect, but, um, I, I, it's my show off time. And I think about it too. It's like, it's not that scary. Like truthfully, you're like you think about people who are competing in sports, like my, my nine-year-old daughter is a competitive gymnast. And I always think about her, like since she was 18 months old, she's been doing flips on a two inch wide beam in front of a panel of judges. Like that's scary. Okay. Like I'm literally posing in a bikini in front of a group of judges, like for like eight seconds. Like that's not that scary. So literally I just, I'm, I'm having fun with it. I'm like, I I just go out there and I'm like, freaking look at me, look at the work I put in and the joy and the knowing that you accomplished something that, especially this last season, because there was definite moments that I was like, I'm not going to be able to finish this. Like I did three peaks back to back. We, it didn't, was, it didn't start out like that, but we did three shows consecutively. And by the time we got to North Americans, I was just, I, I was so, we got very, very lean my conditioning was freaky and it took going to quite a dark place to get there. So, um, by the time I stepped on that stage, I was just, 
I was so freaking pumped. I was just like, I sorry again for the language. No, no worries, everyone. They're all beeped out anyway, so no one really, no one hears the profane. No, again, I let people talk the way they want to talk. No worries. And that was the win, honestly. Like I was like, I we did it. We did it. Like I didn't. There's so many moments that I didn't. I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to finish this, and I finished it. So. Well, and I mean, you talked about one of the things that you also hear too a lot as a bodybuilder is that people don't understand that you're not going to be able to be lean 24-7, you know, 365 days out of the year. How do you deal with the post-show blues? Because for me, that was the one thing that really shocked me when I really got into the, you know, talking to a lot of people in the bodybuilding community. So how do you deal with that? Because for so many people, that is their, their biggest struggle. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have post-show blues because I was really looking forward to it. Another thing a lot of serious bodybuilders will tell you, or anybody who loves winning, uh, there's no balance in winning. It, it, when you want something so bad enough that you want to win and you will do whatever it takes, other things will be sacrificed. And you have to know that going in. If you're going to try to find balance, then don't even try to win. Because... It's, you have to be literally obsessed with winning. It has to be everything. And so my relationships with my friends had to take a backseat. My business had to take a backseat and other people had to take up for me um, because I couldn't do as many clients in a day. I couldn't put the focus on my business like I normally would. And then my relationship with my children, like I, my 40th birthday was during my prep, so I couldn't celebrate my mom's birthday and my grandson, I have a grandson now, his birthday was actually on August 19th, which was one of the days of my show. So I couldn't go to his birthday party. Like all of those things were sacrificed. And so for me, I go right into now, I get to put my focus, my, I still love competing. I still love bodybuilding, but my focus can be on other things other than just my physique. Um, so that's, how I, there's no post show blues because I did everything I set out to do during my competition season. And also we know what work needs to be done. Like I need to, my conditioning was freaky. I, we were able to get it so low, but my size, because I've only been really seriously competing, especially competing enhanced for a year in the 40 year old and masters, a lot of these girls have been competing for 10, 12, many years. And they've had a lot of time to develop their muscle maturity, to put on quite a bit of size. So my, the size discrepancy was quite obvious on the national stage. So I, my stage weight was about 120, 121 pounds. Most of the girls that were in the top were closer to 130, 135, 38. So we need to put on quite a bit of lean mass. So I already know what the goal is. So, and I like myself just about as far as like getting bigger in the off season, like that's not even a problem because I prefer my body. Like I like having some body fat. I feel healthier. I feel better. And I like the way I look better. I mean, who doesn't want to have an ass? I mean, you have, you do trade your abs for them on occasion. I would love to keep my abs and still have a butt, but I still have, I still get little, little side, at, little obliques that, that's about it. Hey, that's all you get, especially for a mom, you know, especially who's had kids. I mean, it's like if you're even able to get a two pack, that's impressive because just everything that goes on. But yeah, that is just, yeah, those post show blues and talking to people who deal with them. It's just, that is just a huge eye opener for me. But I mean, on top of everything that, I mean, you go through as a plan, like that's the thing. I kind of had a plan even beforehand, like, you know, how I was going to, what my focus was going to be post show, what, how I was going to adjust mentally. And what my priorities were going to be helped me go right into that. I think if you don't really have a plan for how you're going to deal with it after the show, that's when you start to really get the blues because you're just like, okay, what's my purpose now? But if you already have a purpose kind of planned out, you can go right into it. Yep. No, ab absolutely. And I'd get killed in the comments down below if I didn't ask you this because – for that question that I asked before, what was one body part that took off and one that dragged behind? For women, the number one answer by far is shoulders. And like you said, you have really great shoulders, better than like 75% of men. So I would get killed in the comments down below and be like, Ryan, you didn't ask her how she how she works her shoulders. So what does a shoulder day look like for you, just for all the guests out there listening? Okay, well, my, my split is divided by push and pull. Push, pull, rest, legs. Push, pull, rest, legs. So um, in my coach programs, all of my um, training – um, so I think, you know, like any type of lateral movement, like we are pushing, um, 
chest press, shoulder press. Um, we use a, you know, a lot of dumbbells. And the biggest thing is like, it's not right. rocket scientist or rocket science. You know what I mean? Like it's the same stuff. It's just doing it consistently in a progressive overload, keeping a log of your lifts and like continuously, you know, one of the biggest things I worked with with Dustin when I started working with him almost a year ago was I wasn't bringing my intensity to the level that I could. Um, I was doing a lot of like reps and reserve training and not training to failure and just not like, I'm not even lying. Like I would, I had self limiting beliefs of what I was capable of lifting. And when I really tried, when I was like, okay, I would send him videos of my training and he's like, okay, yeah, that was great. You need to bump the weight up 10 pounds and you put, you had three more reps in you. So that over that time and sending him videos each week, I'm like, okay, yeah, he's right. So I just, I think it's more importantly than the specific movements you're doing is the intent in which you're doing the movements. I, and I see this a lot at the gym. People's like, I mean, they're like literally going through the motions. There's no mind muscle connection. There's no intent behind the movement. A lot of my movements, I'll have one or two top sets and then maybe two working sets. So it's not a ton of sets, but I promise you, I am spent after those sets because we're bringing the intensity. So a lot of pushing movements with intense, a lot of, uh, you know, all the lateral movements uh, for the delts. I mean, yeah, intensity is almost everything. I mean, you can make a, you can make doing a five pound lateral raise the hardest thing ever if you have the right intensity and you do, you do stuff the right way. So yeah, the weight really doesn't really come into much really of being a factor. And I mean, with everything that goes with this lifestyle too, I mean, it's just, just the mindset too that you need to have to do this. Do you think that being a bodybuilder has helped you like mindset wise in other areas of your life? Cause life, cause I've always said that if you can compete in a show, I mean, you can really accomplish anything in your life. 100%. No question. No. The, and that kind of goes back to what I was talking to you about my routines and stuff like that. Like the more serious I've gotten about bodybuilding, the more structured I've gotten, the more strict that I've gotten, the more, or actually like the less BS that I tolerate in the rest of my life. Um, because I just feel like it just continually has me level up. And when you're leveling up, you don't just level up as a bodybuilder, you level up in every area of your life. So it makes me push to be a better leader. Um, it makes me push my mindset better. Um, it makes me push to be a better parent, a better friend. Um, and you're just, you're constantly trying to improve and that's what bodybuilding is. And that's why you don't just have improvement in one area of your life. You're not just like, Oh, I want to have better glutes, but every other area of my life can suck it. Like, no, you're, you're trying to improve constantly. And, and that's so for sure. Yeah. Every a hundred percent. And and then that continues on. Like I've noticed even in this last prep, it had me become better as a person. No, absolutely. And I mean, I, I save this as we get closer to the end here because nutrition, I mean, it's the most important thing when it comes to this lifestyle. I mean, abs remain in the kitchen. It's totally true. It's like 70 to 80% of the results that you're going to see. What were some of the bigger nutritional changes that you made when you started getting into bodybuilding? Like not just during the weight loss phase, but when you started to really say, okay, I want to bulk up a little bit. Uh, okay. Well, so yeah, you do go through. So it just depends on where you're at in your season. So obviously during improvement season, um, the biggest thing first on that is trusting your coach because he's going to load food and you 100% have to be comfortable with gaining fat and getting bigger because you're, you can't put on lean muscle, lean tissue. And that's like, if you're a serious bodybuilder, then you understand that that's part of the process. Um, and then just nutritionally was really being okay with eating a lot of the same things and keeping it as simple as possible. I make 18 meals in about an hour and a half and that every Saturday, every Sunday morning. And, um, and that includes the cleanup and you, you really have to be, you become so programmed and that food is completely driven for purpose and for fuel and for getting better. Um, in the improvement season, the most important thing is not skipping meals because you go from being super freaking hungry and wanting to eat everything in sight and prep to being like so freaking full that you're like you, the last thing you want to do at like the night when you're home and exhausted is put like warm up another meal and stand there and eat more food. Um, but that part of that's just as important as when you're dieting in your prep. And so yeah, being okay with like 
gaining weight, increasing your calories over time, and then just keeping the food as simple as freaking possible. Like everybody wants every single food that they eat to be like the best meal that they ever had. Like you don't need that. Like you can eat freaking egg whites and oatmeal for breakfast. Like I, I think it tastes delicious, but a lot of people are like, oh, they, they want it to change up and they're like, oh, I'm bored. I literally, every single meal of mine is rice. Like I don't care. Like I don't, I just don't care. I, it's for me, it's, I think it still tastes good, but it doesn't have to be like my favorite meal of all time. Now during the off season, I get free meals. So I'll go out to a beautiful dinner, um, and enjoy that food. Like, you know, there's a time and place for tacos and pizza and burgers and all of that. Um, but like the majority, actually most bodybuilders like really love food and we're foodies. But you guys, you guys torture yourself by watching the food network when you're super lean, which I don't understand how that's a thing really. Diners, di- what is it? D- Triple D diners, drivers and dives. Uh, Guy Ferretti, he's just like, I've lived on that 24 seven or chopped. Oh, so good. It's my favorite. And that's literally, it's still on my TV right now, but, uh, no, you, you just, you got to keep it super freaking simple. Like that's people just try to overcomplicate food. And it's like, it doesn't really need to be that, that complicated. You got to eat enough to, to grow muscle. If you're not eating, you're not going to put on any tissue. Like, like what I tell a lot of people where it's like bodybuilding is hard enough as it is. So the, anything that you can make as easy as possible is going to help you in the long run so much more because just the, just the general sport in and of itself is much harder. But if someone were to come up to you and say, you know, we made the decision, you can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it. What would be one thing that you'd like to see change? Mm, this might be a little controversial. Um, I think each year and it's it's tough because bodybuilding as i've said many times is a sport of improvement and constantly trying to get better and constantly trying to grow and i i do think that some of the protocols some of the levels of conditioning that we're seeing some of the size it does require a very i, I want to be careful how to say this because i'm still very new and green in the sport honestly even after three, four years, um, your health takes a major toll and you do take some risks and it's up to each individual person. And, and, and this is true of every sport, to be honest, like let's look at the injuries in professional football and for, for all professional sports. But here's the difference though. Those guys get paid millions of dollars. Bodybuilders don't. <laughs> right. right. And on an amateur level, we're not getting paid anything. And we do have, uh, you know, lives outside of bodybuilding. And so, you know, the, that's kind of a tough call for me is, is like, at what sacrifice is your personal health worth the reward of the competition? Uh, that's something that I'm kind of figuring out right now on my own. And, and I would like to, I, I often wonder like at what level, is there ever going to be a level where they're like, okay, we're pushing this too far because now, people are going to extreme levels for conditioning that is really kind of scary. Um, so that's, honestly, that's the one thing I would change. Uh, and they put, you know, they have standards for things and then the standards aren't always followed in the judging. Um, you know, as far as like striation and graininess and things like that. So, mm, no, I, I, I agree with you 100%. And I think, you know, with all the, you know, unfortunate tragedies that have happened, especially this year in the sport, hopefully the judges are starting to look at it and say, hey, maybe we are going a little too far and we just need to, you know, slow things down a little bit. It's it's not always in every in every uh, competition, but like on a national level, like especially in my division and figure, you see some of these women are just – very muscularly developed and large, large backs and large, very developed shoulders. But then, you know, at the Olympia level, the standard, um, you know, she's not really huge in person. It's more about her overall shape. And so I'm hoping that that standard kind of still sticks as opposed to just seeing how much bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger we can get. Um, because I think that that sets more of a bar for health. Um, 
if that makes sense. No, a- absolutely. And yeah, there are, and for me too, one of the things would just be, you know, make the judging more balanced because like, yeah, if you competed in one show, they might be like, oh, we want you a little bit more of a leaner look. And then two weeks later you compete at a different show and they're like, oh, we want you a little bit more of a fuller look. So it's, yeah. If for me, if they could just, you know, make it a little more general, like universal, just because, you know, you're already forcing these people to go to extreme measures to even step on the stage anyway. Why are you going to make it even harder for them? Well, by- we're seeing that and there's just inconsistencies. Like, I feel like, you know, like I see, you know, if you look at wellness, for instance, they say like not overly striated or, you know, not very striated lines in the legs and, and the tight, they do want to see, you know, some softness. And then you see the top girls are literally shredded and dice to the bone in the leg. They're very hard. So. Yep, a- absolutely. And what is your relationship like with cardio? Because for me, cardio is the bane of my existence. And when I say actual cardio, I mean like running, because I can go on walks for forever. But unfortunately, when you become a bodybuilder, you sort of sign a deal with the devil when it comes to cardio. So what is your relationship like with just cardio in general? I I never mind cardio, to be honest with you. Um, uh, I, most bodybuilders don't run. Um, we're not built for speed. We're built for power. Um, and running is very counterproductive to what we're trying to do. So most bodybuilders are either walking on an incline. I see a lot of bodybuilders now, I think because Nick Walker is always on his stationary bike, his recumbent bike. I'm seeing more and more people going to recumbent bike. I personally can't do the recumbent bike because it hurts my hips and back. But, um, my coach usually has me use the, the least path of resistance so if we can get where we need to go doing the least amount of cardio that's what we'll do and the least that's gonna burn up tissue so i do a lot of elliptical thankfully he didn't have me do very much stair master um and a lot of walking on an incline and then in the off season we don't do very much cardio at all just a little bit to keep that conditioning and mostly just tracking steps and honestly i i don't mind fasted cardio especially in the off season because it's just a few days a week and That kind of goes back to my crazy routine life um, because it sets my day up. Like I don't mind going and doing, getting a little 20 minute sweat sesh and then going to have my coffee and it just puts my mind in the right place. I'll listen to my podcast and um, you know, obviously during prep when you get to, you know, two hours of cardio or whatever like that freaking sucks. Nobody wants to do that, especially when you have no calories in you. Uh, like that just sucks in general, but I think nobody would disagree with that. But if you're in the sport, you just understand, like, it's part of the process. Like, it's part of the sport. So if you hate any aspect of it, like, go ahead and get out now. And if you could give any piece of advice to anyone who's looking to maybe even just get started in bodybuilding, what would it be? Hire a good coach. Hands down. There are so many hacks out there, especially on a local level. Um, I would say save your money for a little while. If it's a, if it's a financial issue, interview multiple coaches, do your research and hire a good coach. I mean, I honestly, I couldn't have said it better myself really. And when we talk to you a year from today, cause we are going to talk to you cause I enjoy having you on, where would you like to be at just in your bodybuilding journey and just in your overall life? What are some goals that you'd like to have achieved a year from today? You know what? Honestly, that's that's the biggest thing that I'm working on right now. Um, really setting those uh, long term goals. Um, definitely, like I said, the huge factor was my size discrepancy on a national level with the figure girls. Like, very very important. And I really want to have a very dialed in improvement season. Last year was the most dialed in I've been in an improvement season, and this year I just want to continue to level up on that and be even more so dialed in and definitely the, um, you know, major improvements, especially in the areas of my shoulders and my glutes in improvement season. And then, um, yeah, so that's, that's my bodybuilding. Is that what you meant? Like mostly like my body? Yeah. Yeah. Bodybuilding in this industry and just other things in general. I mean, yeah. Anything that you were really looking forward to maybe doing in the next year, basically, or having achieved. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I obviously like just continually growing, like uh, my business is obviously a huge priority for me. It's a young salon. We're doing very well right now and we're in a very good place and, um, hopefully look to open a second location. And, um, so 
I don't plan on competing until this time next year again. So that gives me plenty of time to put on the size that I need as well as accomplish my business and professional goals. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to before we wrap things up? Oh, wow. So, you know, I don't think I can go and not give a shout out to my coach, Justin Mahaley, T. Mahaley and Ashley Jones, who I mentioned before, who is my um, posing coach. Um, they were just absolutely instrumental. And then a good friend of mine, um, her name's Lynn, and she is uh, she turned pro this year at her competition. She won the um, Masters in Pittsburgh in, I think it was in July that she won where she got her pro card. And she's just been an amazing mentor to me, an encouragement. She's also a Masters athlete. She, I think, turned 40, oh God, I think she turned 42 this year, maybe 41. But anyways, uh, it's just awesome to have a friend like that. That's also also the same age and she's a mom and, um, they just get it a little bit more when they're a little closer to your age. So shout out to Lynn for being such an awesome friend to me. Well, as someone who doesn't get it, who's a little bit on the younger side for the last question, what is the difference? Like, you know, for someone who's older working out, because I've had, you know, like 50 and 60 year olds and people my age, I think don't give them enough credit because they don't understand how hard it is. I mean, if you're even walking on a stage at that age, like in your fifties or sixties, even at, even at 40, cause I'm, like I said, I'm 27. I mean, people just do not, my age just do not understand how much more difficult it is and you know, how much more impressive it really is. <clears throat> I think just for me is like the fact that I, you do have a life outside of bodybuilding. So I have to manage a business uh, and my business is not, uh, I'm not a athletic trainer. That's not my job to be in the gym. I don't have parents supporting me where I can, or anyone supporting me for that matter, where I can just like, you know, kind of have a free schedule and spend hours in the gym every day. Like I have to make it up. I literally have to make it happen. There's no, it doesn't just happen naturally. Like I have to schedule it every single day. So just the life of being older and competing. And then also like, you know, I'm all, I think you can accomplish anything at any age when you set your mind to it, but like there is physical limitations when you're competing at 40, 45, 50, you're, you're just physically not going to recover like a 22 or 23 year old does. Um, you don't put on lean tissue the same way and, and at the same rate that a younger person does. Um, I spent a lot of time on body work, massage, chiropractic. In the last three months of my prep, I was getting body work once a week. I was seeing my physical therapist at least twice a week. I was getting cupping, all types of therapies, dry needling, scraping. Like those are very important as a part of a bodybuilder's career anyways, but especially being more mature. So um, it's just, there's a lot more to a lot more aspects um, you know, and I'm proud of that. Yeah. It is an expensive sport. I don't care what anyone says with all the work that you have to get done. All people, I don't, I, I think people should be more aware of that before they get started. Cause that is one of those things where they don't realize like you are not making money doing this. Anyone who, anyone who thinks that they can do that. I mean, it's like, you're not, it's, this is just, this is, a, this, that's what makes it more impressive for me. Cause like you compare it to the NFL. It's like, yeah, I could, are you kidding me for, for $10 million a year, whatever like that, I'd gladly get concussions and stuff like that. But it's like, this is a sport that is done just for pure love of it. A lot of times. Absolutely. Just quality coaching alone is four to five thousand dollars a year. So your initial investment of hiring a good coach for a year, which you don't even bother if you're not going to do a minimum of a year because you need a year. Um, yeah. So just the coaching investment um, alone is that, and then you're looking at at least another couple thousand between suits, makeup, stands, hairs, posing. I mean, just in this season alone, because I competed, I'm super freaking bougie, and I have to do it like. I can't half-ass anything. I, I'm going to say I spend around $5,000 between travel, my suits, not including coaching, um, between my suits, jewelry, tans, makeups, hair, travel. It was about $5,000. Hey, if you're going to do it, you got to do it in style. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, I mean, there are slightly cheaper ways. I mean, I guess you could do your own hair and makeup. You could get a cheaper suit, but then you don't wink. Those things are, look, your total package 
they look at the total pack. people do not understand that too as well is that it's not just a show it's not just people with muscles going i mean it's there's so many more aspects to winning that show where yeah if you walked on there even with a tan but you didn't have the right makeup or any the hair done people do not understand that i think that it's it's more if than you just a dazzled yourself your suit yourself the next or yeah, yeah it, it's different than, like with the guys where if a guy showed up and he just had like a crew cut or something like that that wasn't really done it wouldn't really matter but with the women yeah it's much more of a it's a beauty pageant with muscles basically is what someone described it with is what it is yeah i mean they are looking at the package that you're presenting so yep, absolutely and again you guys everyone go and check out angela's instagram page i'll leave a link down below and you know buyer beware you will be inspired to get out get out of the couch and stop eating those twinkies but again angela thank you so much for coming on i really thank appreciate you so it so much thank you it was awesome to talk to you are you kidding me i mean she did all she did almost all the work everyone so i love these podcasts where i just have to sit back and relax or whatever i mean it's just these are my favorite ones so she will definitely be on again but again yeah is there anything else that you'd like to say before we wrap it up uh no thank you it was awesome talking to you and everybody um i just want to i do want to say like whatever you want to accomplish you can accomplish with hard work and commitment and discipline and the days are going to pass anyways don't time it's a misconception that you have time you don't have time do it now just take those first steps to accomplishing whatever you you wish that you could accomplish just take those first small steps and you would be absolutely amazed what you can do absolutely i couldn't have said it better myself and again you guys go and give her a follow i'll leave a link down below and this is ryan johnson dd on the spot signing off have a great day everyone